So I appreciate everybody coming out today and listening to me talk for about an hour or so. Uh, who here has been to one of these workshops before? I know we've got a few fleet. So we've seen a few of you at these things before. Who's the first comers? Okay, who's, who's a guest that's never been to the office before? Awesome. So that tells me that there's somebody in this room that cares enough about you to bring you here. Or maybe they're sick of listening to you complain about how you're not sleeping at night and they're, they're trying to do something. I love this workshop because there's really no way I can fail at this one. It's like either I'm going to bore you guys to death and you're going to get some sleep. And we're recording this one so anytime you're having a hard time sleeping, you can pull it out, watch it on YouTube and get some Z's. Or you might learn something, which is what I hope, and then you'll, it'll help you guys get better sleep. So as many of you know, and for those of you that don't, we, every month we do a different workshop. We call it the Body Signals Program. Okay? And we're talking about specific things that we often hear about in the office that people struggle with, and we, we talk about what can we do about it. What can you do about it at home? What can we do about it as a chiropractor? And we try to help people lead the best, healthiest lives that they possibly can. This month's topic is sleep. So who, who here struggles to sleep at night? You're not getting enough sleep, or maybe you're getting enough hours in, but you're feeling wasted and not you're feeling depleted. You're not getting restful sleep. You're not feeling like you're waking up rejuvenated. And they're both common problems. We all know what this means. And especially the younger generations, I mean, I mean, this is pretty much a death knell for little kids these days. But low battery, we're out of juice. We've got problems. We got things we gotta do, and we just don't got the energy to do it. It's becoming a really, really common phenomena, phenomena in this stressful modern environment we live in. So we're gonna talk about several different topics when we're talking about sleep. Some of the common ones that people suffer from, and obviously this is not an all-inclusive list because I can't go over every single potential problem with sleep that we could do in just about a 45 minute hour presentation. But these are some of the common ones. We're dealing with things like sleep apnea, thoracic outlet syndrome, restless legs. Are these familiar terms to people? Have you guys heard these ones before? No. Okay, thoracic outlet, is that one that, okay, we're, we're gonna get to it. So these are common things that we know. You probably know what it is, you've just maybe never heard it called that before. So who here remembers this graphic? And I know my freaking flyers. Who's been to the better, Dr. Matt's Better Results Faster workshop yet? Some of you, this one? So this is the iceberg. What's the iceberg represent? Someone help me out. It's a problem, right? What's the tip of the iceberg represent? Symptoms. Symptoms, pain. What's the bottom represent? Yeah, all the stuff we don't feel, right? What do you think drives people to visit me for the first time? When do I meet most people? When they're annoyed with that, when they're tired of dealing with that, right? But what would happen? So say I chisel that top of that ice off. Now there's no more ice sticking up. We don't feel it anymore. Fix the problem, right? No, because what's still there? All of that. And we leave that alone for, say, three months, and what happens? Yeah, now we got that sticking on the water, and that's gotten bigger. The problem's gotten worse. That's a really great analogy. That's why I put this slide in every single presentation I do. This is the situations we deal with with people. Most people experience that, and then they, then they act. And what do they typically do when they act? I got some pain. What do I do? Yeah, go to the medicine cabinet and grab Tylenol, ibuprofen, whatever your poison is. Take that to feel better, right? We chisel off the top of the iceberg. We never address the true cause of it. That's what these workshops are about. It's learning how to speak and interpret the signals your body are giving you, hence body signals, to take care of the problems and correct the problems so we don't have to deal with the symptoms anymore instead of just chiseling off the symptoms. Okay? How many of you have seen this slide before? Freaking flyers again. So, wellness continuum. Where are we all on this continuum? That's a question we've got to ask ourselves. We all exist. If we're alive, we're on here somewhere. And what are we doing on this continuum? Freaking flyers, help me out. We're moving, right? You're either making decisions that are going to push you to the side no one wants to be, or push you to the side everybody wants to be. Where do I meet most people? When they come in the office first time. They're somewhere over here. And it's not normally just the signs. It's usually they've been ignoring the signs long enough. Now they've got true symptoms. Now they've got problems. They're trying to get rid of those things and they've been dealing with them for a while. But everybody wants to get here. 
That's what these workshops are about. And the other thing about we're all moving on this continuum somewhere, okay? We all also have momentum making decisions that are going to push us this way or push us that way. So if I'm making a lot of poor health decisions, so say I'm not sleeping well, say I'm not eating well, say I'm not exercising, all these bad decisions I'm making, these poor health decisions, are going to push me this way. Does it make sense that the more of those decisions, those bad decisions I'm making, I'm going to start getting some momentum heading in the wrong direction, right? So sometimes it's not even as simple as we sit there and try to stop some of the bad decisions. We've got to stop that bad momentum and start teaching them the good things to head that way where everybody wants to go. That's what these workshops are about. And that's why I love when I see unfamiliar faces at these things because it means that there's people out there that are reaching out to the people they care about and say, hey, come listen to this guy talk. Hopefully it makes a lot of sense. And I hope this does make a lot of sense by the time we're done. So there, there's got to be a better model for how we treat things than what we typically grow up with, right? So our traditional allopathic model is I get sick or I have a symptom. Maybe I go see the doctor. If I don't go for the over-the-counter med, what's the doctor do? Prescribe surgeries, maybe some physical therapy or something like that. But they don't, they don't go after the true cause of the problem, okay? So we've got to live by a better premise. So the first part of the better premise is it natural to be healthy or unhealthy? What's normal? Healthy, healthy right? Your body is designed to be healthy. Everybody's designed to be healthy. Your body is always going to strive to adapt and overcome whatever stresses the environments are going to throw at you. We're designed to be healthy, okay? Is your body smart or stupid? It's crazy smart, right? Think about all the things that are going on inside of each and every one of you right now. Tons of things. Everyone in here has a heart that's beating. Everyone in here has lungs that are breathing. Everybody's maybe drinking some coffee or about to eat some delicious food. Your body's going to digest that. How much energy and thought, well, how much thought do you have to dedicate to all these processes? None, right? It just happens. We just kind of take it for granted until it's not working right. So healthy, your body is smart and healthy is normal. Now unhealthy is a norm we've created with our very unnatural society. And a lot of times we can make decisions that interrupt our smart body's ability to adapt. But those are the new, those are the actual normals. What controls everything in your body? Your nervous system. Everything in your body is hardwired somewhere into our brain, right? What's the hardest substance your body makes? Bone, yeah, spine. So why does it encase the skull, or the, why is the skull encasing the brain and bone? Protection, right? Your smart body knows it's the really important organ. It's got to protect it. It's the only organ in the body completely encased in solid bone other than a few other holes where things come out and stuff like that. Your spinal cord, an extension of the brain, it's not solid bone all the way up and down because you want to be able to move, but it's ring after ring after ring after ring after ring of solid bone, your intelligent body protecting its most valuable assets. Then we have things like ribs and stuff like that that do protect a lot of important things too. But right now my heart could stop beating. If someone knows CPR, you could some pump on my chest, maybe blow some breaths in my If we got my heart beating again and my brain is still alive, I still live to fight another day, right? What happens if I go brain dead right now? That's it. Game over, right? So your spine is like your suit of armor. And then here's a silly one. Is, is life today stressful or not? Raise your hand if your life is stressful. Raise your other hand if your life is more stressful now than it was last year. Yeah, life is stressful and it's getting more stressful. Is, do we expect our stresses are going to go away, just magically disappear? No, life is getting more stressful. And I, uh, my experience is you trade one form of stress for another. Maybe before I was a student, I was worried about exams and stuff like that. Now I'm graduating, I'm a doctor, I'm still paying out student loans. Maybe that's the stress I'm dealing with. You never lose stress, you just morph the stress into a different channel or a different source of it. So we're living very unnatural lifestyles. I want to paint a picture for you guys. What's the natural state of the human body? I want you to think of back in like hunter-gatherer days, like caveman type things, okay? What do we do? What's our life like? Eat, sleep. Eat, sleep. So when do we wake up? When the sun comes up, right? What do we do? 
get up and start maybe looking for some food or something like that, right? We're out and active until when? Well, until the sun's really hot. And then we know, okay, the sun's really high, it's really hot, we're gonna burn a lot of energy here, so we usually go and hide out for like the, the noon time, like the siesta time. That's when we go and do that. And then after that, we come back out when the sun's going down, now it's more climate, and then the sun starts to go down all the way, and then it's time, okay, now it's time to go rest, reproduce, all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's the natural cycle. Who here lives a life like that these days? Nobody, right? Nobody. It's just not, it's not natural. That's the way we were designed to function, but we created with all of our wonderful technology and advances and everything, a very unnatural lifestyle that we all live. And it all boils to one word, it boils down to one word, stress. Stress is the operative word. There's three major sources of it. There's thoughts, there's traumas, there's toxins, okay? All three of those are a form of stress. All three of those are the ultimate source of our demise and things breaking down. And then we have the circadian rhythm. Who's heard of this before? This is a natural cycle. So in the morning, we look over here, 6 a.m., sun's coming up, we get a big a rise in blood pressure. Your melatonin, everybody knows what melatonin is? It's a neurotransmitter your brain makes to help us fall asleep at night when the sun's going down. The body stops making it from the early morning. Why would it do that? It's time to wake up, right? Now we're at our highest level of alertness around 10 a.m. Then we go around for noon, we're usually taking a nap around then, or just getting out of the sun. We're our fastest, most coordinated in the early afternoon. And then as we start getting on later into the day, things start ramping back down. And that's the natural cycle. But we've really messed this thing up with our modern lifestyles. Cortisol. Does everybody know what cortisol is? It's a stress hormone. But it's also a natural hormone we experience when we have things like the sun coming up. So this is a natural cortisol cycle of like the caveman. Here he is, sun's up, cortisol is going down, or it's a, it's a, moon's coming up, cortisol is going down, when the sun comes up, it spikes up. Why does it do that? Because we want that blood, heart start pumping. What happens when we get stressed? Heart starts racing. Maybe you get a little adrenaline pump in, you get that like anti-agitated feeling. So you're naturally ramping up in the morning to help wake us up, snap us out of that sleep that we just came out of. Cortisol naturally rises. As the day goes on and it's time to ramp down, that's when the cortisol naturally is supposed to ramp down. But what we're finding is today we have chronically elevated cortisol. Why? Okay. So one word answer. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Yeah, stress. We have stress all the time. So if I was, I, I know you guys have heard the bear story a million times, if I'm being attacked by a bear right now, what's gonna happen? My body's gonna create a bunch of stress hormones to help me either fight back or get my butt out of there so I survive, right? But now the bear's not a bear. Now the bear is my student loan payments. Now the bear is the fact that I've got a talking point of about 20 people and well, I'm okay with public TV now. But once upon a time it made me really nervous. Or maybe the stress is I've got to run all the way to Bronson to bring my girlfriend's little sister back home right after this and it's going to be a time bunch. So we have all these stresses out there. Now the bear's never gone. Your cortisol is constantly elevated. You never have that chance to ramp back down and that's causing all kinds of problems. Limited exertion, chronic psychological stress, sleep deprivation, all elevate that cortisol level. And when we have that, we have those unnatural cycles, unnatural lightings. Have anybody ever heard about the, the lightings on like the cell phones and stuff like that? How they stimulate a part of your brain called the pineal gland that creates that, that those hormones, those neurotransmitters that want to either wake you up or help you fall asleep. So we're going to talk about what we need to do with our devices to make sure we're not screwing that stuff up. And then we have elevated cortisol. What does that lead to? Fat storage, right? Why? And why does it store it on my belly? What do you think? Anybody? So we got smart bodies, right? It's got to do it for a reason. It's not just like, this is a good, a good place to place. So if I'm hunter-gatherer day, I need some extra fat on me, what's the best place to put it on? If I've got to be able to run and use my arm and use my legs and stuff like that, do I want all my fat around my ankles where it's going to be slowing me down? Do I want all my fat up in my shoulders where I might not be able to like, use my bow and arrow or my spear or whatever I'm using? No, it stores it right here 
because it's going to protect some of my internal organs, and it's also out of the way, so I can still move around as best as I can until the problem starts getting too big, right? So that's intelligent design. Now I know everybody loves doing diets and burpees and everything, but what if one of the solutions to our problem was just sleeping better? Getting rid of that little extra bit of belly fat was simply sleeping better. It's a big part of the equation. So good practices. Use that circadian rhythm as a guide. Try to stick to that. That's hard in this day's study. Who here is my late, my second and third shifters? Anybody? Has anybody ever worked second and third shifts before? Well, yeah. They're hard, so, right? Yeah. Like I, I did for a short, short time did the graveyard shift and it destroyed my life. Like I felt like a zombie half the time. I was sick more often. My little brother did it for a long time. He was cleaning and doing all these things. Third shift, he already ever saw the sun. By far, that was the time he was the sickliest in his life. He got a lot more flus, a lot more colds, just run down a lot of the time. It's because we need that natural cycle. We need things like sunlight. We're designed to function in that. We're not, by nature, nocturnal animals. Eight to nine hours of sleep, restful sleep. That's where those, those sleep trackers are a nice thing, where we can do like the Fitbits or like the aura rings or things like that. Things that help track. When are you sleeping? How much are you tossing and turning? Because that's all an indicator of what kind of sleep you're getting. Because there's different levels of sleep. There's that deep sleep where we do our resting, our repair work. There's lighter stages of sleep where we're not doing that stuff. Sometimes some of us never get to that deep level of sleep that we really need to recover from our injuries. There's dark, quiet, comfortable. You should make your bedroom, your sleep area, a sleep sanctuary. Ideally, no outside lights. Even like the alarm clocks with the bright screens and stuff like that, that can interrupt your natural sleep cycle. So you want to try to be sealed off, quiet, dark. Think of it as like a sleep sanctuary. That's going to help. E-fasting, not using your screen at least an hour before bed, okay? And even if you're going to use it, at least use that, you know how they have the blue light filters now? That's designed to try to cut out that type of light that's going to stimulate that part of the brain that creates the hormones that wake things up, okay? Reducing alcohol and caffeine. Kind of seems like a no-brainer, right? Although some people are like, boy, my nightcap helps me fall asleep, right? It might. It might, make you, it might knock you out, just like a sleeping pill might knock you out, but what's it disrupting? The, the deep sleep. It can help prevent you. It creates that excited state of things. It's going to prevent you from getting those deeper levels of sleep that you really need to get to. And then caffeine, caffeine's a stimulant. I know some of us, like Dr. Matt and I, we drink coffee all day long, and I can drink coffee before bed and still fall asleep, but I know it's just like drinking alcohol. It's gonna ramp things up. Even if I can physically fall asleep in my bed, I'm not getting the best quality sleep that I could be getting or should be getting. And then making it a household culture. Who here thinks it would be hard to be like, hey, I'm gonna start going to bed at eight o'clock when my husband or my wife goes to bed at like midnight, one o'clock, all my kids go to bed at 11 o'clock, but I'm going to bed at 8 o'clock. How likely are you to succeed at that? It's not very. Not very, right? you got to make it a household thing. So get everybody in on it. Hey, hey we're all going to make this decision together. We're, going, we're turning our devices off at 9 o'clock. We're going to bed at 10 o'clock or whatever you want to do. And then make sure you allow yourself adequate amount of time. I've got to wake up at around 4.35 o'clock in the morning to get my morning routine done and get to work on time most mornings. That means I have to go to bed usually by 10 o'clock is what I shoot for, 10 to 11. Now I'm a night owl, right? This is one of the things I struggle the most with still sleep. I've done a lot of healthy things to help myself. Still got some of that belly fat on there. And I think sleep is a big part of my problem because I'm that night owl by nature, but my jobs that I've had for the last seven, eight years have required me not to be a night owl in the sense of I wake up early but some of those tendencies, I'm still up. I look at the clock, it's like one o'clock in the morning, it's like, oh, you gotta wake up in three, four hours. You should probably go to bed. So let's get to some of those common issues we were talking about. Before we talk about that, this chart. I love this chart, because this explains it all so beautifully. What is this in the middle? It's fine. It is just fine, but it's just fine. So what is it? Your nervous system, all that yellow stuff. And it's the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the part that controls everything that's automatic in your life, like the heart beating, the lung breathing, all those automated processes we don't have to think about. We have a circuit breaker over here. 
right where the spine is, right? Why? Both on the right, you're both on the right track. Yeah. It's a good analogy for what that is. So my power goes out. Say I'm in my living room watching TV. TV and lights turn off in the living room. The lights are still on in the kitchen. What do I do? Go check a breaker, right? And then one of those switches is flipped. That switch is flipped. That one's not getting power. That goes to my living room. So what do I do? Switch, right? What happens? Power starts going, TV comes back on, living room lights come back on, right? Now the breaker collapses your spine. Now it's not the lights going to my living room and TV. Now it's the lights going to my lungs. Breaker switch. What happens? Maybe my lungs don't work so good. Maybe I have asthma. Maybe I have COPD. Maybe I have something else that's not working. Maybe that breaker goes to my stomach. What's happening? So I'm getting heartburn, right? I'm getting indigestion, I'm gassy, I'm bloating, I'm eating ulcers, I'm having stomach problems, digestive problems. What do we do as chiropractors? Get to the breaker box, flip the switch, turn it back on. That's what we do, that's why I love this thing. It's such a beautiful thing. Does everybody get that? Every level you have a nerve that comes off that spine. Those nerves branch out and supply everything, every cell, every organ, every tissue, every gland, everything in your body ties into those nerves somewhere. If we turn a switch off at the spine, that can affect everything that nerve goes to. I like the dam in the river analogy. You put a dam in a river, it affects everything downstream, right? Essentially, we put dams in the river of our nerve flow when we have these nerve irritations along the spine. I think that's my next slide, the big idea of subluxation. Can we all say subluxation? Subluxation. We've all heard this word, right? Who's not heard this word before? Big fancy word for a bone that's stuck out of place. But it's more than that. It's this whole cascade of problems. We have a joint that's misaligned. That creates soft tissue damage. We have inflammation as a result of that. That inflammation irritates the nerve. Now the nerve is irritated and the brain's aware of it. What does it do? It starts to tighten everything up. So if Colleen was about to punch me in the stomach right now and I saw it coming, I'd flex my gut, right? Same thing with my paraspinal muscles. My brain gets a signal, something's not right in there. I'm not sure what's going on. Muscles, you're my first line of defense. Lock it up. Now it's my back's all tight. Now we've got joints stuck. Now you're creating stress hormones. The bear's back. But now the bear is irritation in my spine, inside of me. Now we have cortisol production. Cortisol does all this stuff. I don't need to read it to you, but it, creates that fight or flight mechanism. It's preparing you to fight that bear or get away. So let's talk about sleep apnea. What's sleep apnea? You stop yeah, you ultimately you stop breathing. There's, there's many causes. A lot of them are associated with things like being overweight or losing that neck curve. Does everybody remember what way the neck curve is supposed to be? This is my face, this is the back of my head. My neck should be a nice backward shaped C. They call it the arc of life. When we lose that curve, that can cause irritation on things like the nerves that supply the muscles in the throat, that can cause the airways not to be as open, that can cause things to block. It could be a communication from the brain not working. It could be being too heavy. It could be a lot of different problems, but we stop breathing. A lot of times sleep apnea, what we find as chiropractors is upper cervical or lower cervical problems. Cervical is like the neck bones, okay? Very top, very bottom. Those are often things we find irritation on. We clean that out. We see people with sleep apnea often get better. Thoracic outlet syndrome. So who here has ever had their hands fall asleep, especially when they're trying to sleep? That's often a sign of thoracic outlet syndrome. So what happens? We have nerves that come down. They come from my neck. They form what's called the brachial plexus. It's a big bundle of nerves that goes down through all this stuff in my shoulder. And that's what supplies everything going down in my hand. Some of it passes underneath my collarbone. Some of it goes through all this shoulder stuff in here. There's some muscle, there's a lot of muscles in the shoulder. The mu shoulder's a very muscular joint. It's a ball in a socket that kind of hangs there and there's a bunch of muscles that tie that thing together. So if I start putting irritation on those nerves higher up, either in my neck, in my upper back, where my shoulder, where things exit out, like my clavicles drop, my, my collarbones drop down, compressing on those nerves, 
Now I've lost feeling in my fingers because I put a dam in the river high upstream and this is what's being affected. Or maybe I'm not numb, but I'm like drinking my coffee in the morning and it's like I drop my coffee cup or I just feel like, a, like my hand's shaking. It doesn't have the strength that you should have. The problem's not in my hand or carpal tunnel. Who here has had carpal tunnel? Yeah. So they go, they, they put the electrodes in there, right? Here and here. And they say, yeah, there's, there's conduction moss there. We'll go and slip that thing open, free up room for those nerves to breathe. What often happens down the road? Symptoms come back, right? Because what didn't we do? We, we fixed the problem here, but we didn't fix the problem. Maybe there's impingement on the nerve here. We got another dam in the river here. Maybe another dam up here. Often the first dam's up here where the nerves start in the neck. You add all those sums together, it's called double crush syndrome. It's not one insult that's causing the problem, it's multiple insults along the course of that nerve root. And we addressed it here, but we didn't address it here, here, or here. Now this problem's gotten worse, my carpal tunnel's back, but it's not really carpal tunnel, it's a neck issue. People think I'm crazy sometimes, because they're like, my hands are falling asleep. And I'm like, all right, let's lay it on the table. First place I go, I'm gonna start looking at their hands, I start looking at their neck. I'm biased, I'm a chiropractor, I, I get just as fine, that's where, I, that's where I go to. And they're like, no doc, the problem's down here. And I was like, I understand you feel the problems down here, let's check up here first. And then I find something up here, and you're like, you know, you feel that? And I'm like, yeah, that really hurts, stop touching that. And I'm like, that's the problem. That's what's starting the problem. I'm not saying there's not a problem here too. We might have to address that as we go through, but a lot of times we address what's going on here, what's going on down, these ones start to correct themselves. Because the body's smart, it's designed to heal, it's designed to be happy, healthy, it communicates all that intelligence through my nerves. If my nerves are working right, a lot of these things fix themselves. Does that make sense? So thoracic outlet, a lot of times we find that a little bit farther down in the spine, mid thoracic, so like this area, when you're through here. Restless leg syndrome, who has this one? Anybody? Yeah, it sucks, right? It's hard, especially you're kicking, he probably has to deal with it too because you're kicking him in bed, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, where does that problem probably start? What do you think? Right down below, same concept, except we're up here. The nerves that come out down here, they go into the bottom half of you. Irritation of the nerves down here, now you feel like I gotta wiggle that. Have you ever like hit yourself on something and you rub it? it makes you feel better? Why does that feel better? Yeah, you're stimulating specific nerves. So there's pain nerves, there's vibration nerves. Pain nerves are skinny little nerves. Tiny, if that's the diameter of the nerve, that's what I'm trying to show there. This is the vibration nerve, a big fat nerve. So I just hit myself on, I just bump my elbow really hard and it hurt really bad. And I'm going, ow, oh, dang, that hurt. I'm rubbing it. What am I doing? I'm stimulating the vibration nerves, right? Now I've got a race going on. I got pain nerves that are stimulated from bumping my elbow. I got vibration nerves that are stimulated from me rubbing it. This one wins because it's got a bigger cable. It gets there faster. My brain feels the vibration, it doesn't feel the pain. I'm fixing the problem, right? Same concept with like ice or heat, or like uh, ice actually helps with uh, inflammation, it's like biofreeze. Biofreeze, we love it, right? Great, great product. Biodor, great, great product. It's just tricking your brain into saying, excuse me, hey, don't hurt. Feel the cold, feel that sensation, don't feel that pain sensation. So that's what we're doing there. It's called the gating principle, okay? Subluxation, big fancy word. So it's a whole cascade of process. So I love this picture. Look what we got here. See how that bone's all got pointy edges, that space between the bones are really thin. See what's going on there? Don't take my <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm covering it now. So here we are. I often hear it. So that's arthritis, the bone spur and stuff like that. That's arthritis. And this line here. Um, who here thinks arthritis is just a normal part of the old? I do. I know it's not technically, but it, I do. Still. It's, common. it's a common thing with getting old, I'll, I'll give you that. But when I, tell, when I have someone tell me, hey, it's just normal that I have arthritis, that's just a normal part of getting old, say this person's 65 years old, how old is that bone? 65. 65, right? Yeah, it's not true. How old is that bone? 65. If that's just a normal part of being 65, why does that look like that? because of the stresses that this one's dealt with for the 65 years that caused it to get like that. It's called Wolf's Law. Bone remodels off the stresses going through it. Um, so, Dr. Matt, who here knows Dr. Matt? Raise your hands. Yeah, big guy, right? Likes to work out, he's a crossfitter. 
He works out a lot. He wakes up at like three o'clock in the morning every morning and works out every morning except like Thursday is his one day off ever. The guy works out a lot. I work out, but I'm not that fanatical about it, okay? If you were to dissect all my skeleton out and all of Dr. Matt's skeleton out, do you think they'd look different? His would be a lot more bulky pronounced where all the muscles tie into the bones would be a lot more knobby and developed because he picks up heavy things and he moves heavy things and he's running all the time and he's doing all those crazy things that CrossFitters do, developing that, that puts a lot of stress on his bones. The intelligent body says, okay, if he's gonna put this demand on my bone, I better make this bone bigger and stronger so it starts to develop it. That's why they recommend free weights, especially for the aging population, especially women. Because what do women have to go through that us men, unfortunately, don't have to go through? Menopause. Menopause. What happens with menopause? Thin. Your bones tend to thin. You guys got a, a raw deal with that one. But what can help prevent the, the osteopenia, the osteoporosis? Weight-bearing exercise. Not just working out. Cardio's not going to do it. It's got to be weight-bearing exercise. Free weights. Picking up heavy things repetitively. It builds up those bones. Now, it's not going to stop it from... There comes a point when we're all starting to lose our bone density slightly. It's just a matter of if we're working out, we might not lose it very fast. And eventually, if I'm going to die like right here, hopefully I don't have a problem before I hit that point. Whereas if I don't do anything and I lose it all really fast, I start to have problems before I hit the finish line, okay? And that's when I'm breaking things. And a lot of times it's not, I fall and I break something when I have osteoporosis. A lot of times it's like, I broke my hip and that caused me a fall type of problem. The causes of subluxation, all of our bad habits added together are what cause our spines to subluxate. It's all the stresses we deal with it. What kind of stresses are there? What are the three types of stresses? You just talked about Trauma. Trauma. Yep, three Jeez. Thoughts. Traumas. Toxins. Physical stress. Mental stress. Chemical stress. What's arguably the worst stress out of the three? Mental, Mental stress. Why? You're always, You're always thinking. That's a good one. I never thought of it like that before. What else does mental stress cause? Has anybody ever been stressed out about something and everything starts getting really tight? Depression, anxiety, chemicals, neurotransmitters, hormones, stress hormones. Your thoughts create a lot of those too. So it's a triple whammy. You have the mental anxiety, you have the chemicals your body's creating because of all the stress, and now everything's getting all tight and all that stuff's getting bunched up in there because we're not getting that blood moving through to pump it out. So. I think I've shown some of you this diagram before. This is a study that shows what it happens as we lose our normal neck curve and have head forward head posture. There are studies that show us for every inch we go forward and down, we're adding up to 25 pounds of pressure, stress to all these structures up here. And more often than not, I'm seeing people looking like this. This is gonna be an epidemic. All these kids growing up with this their entire life, I'm already seeing reverse neck curves. Like if this is my face and this is my head and this is how it should be curved, more often than not, kids less than 20 have at least straightened out. If not, they're curving in the complete opposite direction. Migraine headaches, sleep problems, behavioral issues, ADHD, lots and lots of problems, irritation on the spine. And what's in that part of the spine, up in the neck, especially at the very top of it? That's a little bit higher. So brainstem, the medulla, right below it. A lot of basic life functions come out of that. Sudden infant death syndrome, who's heard of that before? There are studies that show that infants that are born, that's one of the most traumatic processes most of us go through. The very first trauma we ever have is just coming out of the birth canal because they're pulling, they're twisting, they're just getting baby out of there because that's objective number one. You leave them in there too long, they might die. So we gotta get them out, right? Upper cervical subluxations. There are studies that link it to sudden infant death syndrome. Because why? That's right around the brainstem. What's the brainstem control? Basic functions, heartbeat, lungs breathing, all those things that we need to live, irritated right out the gate, causing loss of life and function. That's why we push to see kids in our office. We, we focus on pediatrics. The youngest one I've ever adjusted was less than three days old. Mom brought him to my office this one when I was at, at Wayland. This was when I was at Bronson. Brought him to my office three days, less than three days, like two and a half days old. Didn't even bring him home yet. First time they brought him, Anywhere straight to my office, they wanted their baby check. Their entire family was getting adjusted. Their family started chiropractic, not with me, they had started with another chiropractor and then moved to the area. 
it was their, their youngest daughter, oh, well, the youngest daughter before the one that I adjusted, was having bedwetting problems. Nobody could figure this out. They went and saw the chiropractor, found there was irritation down in the sacrum. They fixed that, bedwetting stopped. Next thing you know, the entire family was in to see the chiropractor. And then they grew up with a great culture, did great with them. They moved to my area. They're like, hey, we're looking for a chiropractor. It was really humbling. I still have a picture of her on my refrigerator. It's like every time I have a bad day, it's like I look at that and it's like, this is why I do it. So the three legs, well, I skip that. I can't skip that. Who's seen this one before? What is this? It is a stool. What are the three legs represent? Yeah. No? Oh, you guys, Dr. Matt's gonna groan when he watches this one. It's the, the three-legged stool, how we fix people's problems. We always say we take a three-legged stool approach to correcting problems. What are the three legs of the stool? If you don't know, they're right here on the board. <laughs> Breaking your bad habits. Remember that continuum where we go healthy way or sick way? Bad habits push me sick way, good habits make me healthy way. Get rid of the ones that push me this way, add the ones that push me this way. Breaking the bad habits, adding good habits. Sometimes you can't break the bad habits. Sometimes my bad habit is work. Like I do a lot of the notes at work. I'm on the computer a lot. I tell people all the day, have good posture, especially when I'm on the computer. What do I catch myself invariably doing if I'm doing notes too long? Sitting there, my legs crossed up like this, I punched over like this, and I'm like, why is my back hurt? Oh yeah, look at me. I've been like this for the last 45 minutes. Is this a natural state for me to be holding? but it's becoming a normal these days, okay? We have add specific exercises. Who here's got their exercises if you're in the office? I think most of you, you guys probably not yet, you're not quite there yet. Most of you have gotten there, you're not quite there yet, but we'll get you there. Specific exercises, but what do we gotta do? We gotta re-educate the muscles to hold things when they're fixed, right? So we wait till we get them closer to fixed before we start re-educating, because I don't wanna re-educate the bad spine. I wanna re-educate, it's like a, a golf swing. I'm not a golfer, but I've heard if you learn a bad golf swing, you can't just learn a new golf swing. You have to go and unlearn the bad golf swing before you can learn the good golf swing. And then chiropractic adjustments. And it's adjustments in what? Adjustments in rhythm that fix the problems. It's not one adjustment. It'd be awesome. I would love if I could fix everybody's problems with one adjustment and everybody would love it. I would charge a lot more for that one adjustment, but it would be awesome. It'd be easy. I could be like, yeah, I adjusted one time, I fixed all your problems. <laughs> Great. If you have a problem coming, come back and I'll adjust it again. Miracle. It would be. It would be awesome. Sometimes we get dramatic relief from symptoms with one adjustment. I see that happen a lot. But even those people, those are the ones I worry about more because they get that dramatic symptom relief in one adjustment, they think their problem's gone and it's not gone. I know it's going to take them 24 adjustments or 36 adjustments with the exercises, with the stretches, whatever the recommendations are. I don't just make recommendations because it's like, well, 36 sounds like a good number. I'll recommend 36 for him. Eh, he's a 24. Oh, just, it's not I'm throwing darts at a wall or something like that. It's all based off of what? Who's here has gone through the spinal degeneration chart? We looked at that. We looked at your x-rays in that one, and we looked at this is where you're at. This is what it takes to fix somebody here. This is what we got to do to fix it. And then we give you the option. Are you on board? Because you're on board, I'm on board. If you're not on board yet, come back when you're on board because we're ready to fix it. So you can't sleep, get adjusted. Sleep better. Battery's dying. It's a problem, right? Nobody wants to be here. We all want to be here. Who really feels like this every day of their life? Nobody, right? Not even me. I get adjusted a lot. I do a lot of things right. I'm not at 100% all my life either. But that's what these workshops are about. So how do you know if you have a subluxation? How do you know if you have a problem in that spine? There you go. I like where you're going. Someone said, I think I, you said sore? Yeah. You feel it, right? Who here remembers how much of the nervous system is responsible for pain? I'm going to get you this time. What is it? Six to eight percent, yes. She always says all of it. You got it. You got it. Fine. Uh, six to eight percent, tiny, tiny little bit, little tiny bit of it tells your brain it hurts. So what happens if my nerves are irritated, but it's not hitting that six to eight percent that tells my brain it hurts? I don't have a soreness. How do I know if I have that subluxation? No, that's clear. That's why we're here. How could we know? 
What were you saying? You said something. You said x-rays, right? Yeah. What is x-rays part of? Chiropractic process. Right. Yeah, chiropractic analysis. Come see the chiropractor. You're curious if you have a cavity, what do you do? Go see the dentist, right? You sit there and stare at yourself in the mirror and be like, can you see that thing? Yeah? You go see the dentist, right? You go see the chiropractor if you want to see if your spine's okay. That's what we do. Our evaluation to find these things, it's not voodoo, it's not witchcraft. It's this stuff. There's instrumentation, the scans. Everybody loves scans, right? Everybody's favorite thing in the office. We do them because they really give us a lot of information of how things are working, where they're not working, where do we gotta focus energy to fix things, okay? There's motion palpation, static palpation. So who here remembers being in the room with me? What am I doing along your spine? Feeling, and I find that spot, and I'm like, you feel that right there? You guys remember this? And it's like, you feel that? And you're like, yeah, that, that, that hurts, stop pushing on that. And I'm like, hey, you, you had by chance get heartburn? And you're like, yeah, how do you know that? You're psychic, and I'm like, no. Those nerves that branch off right there, they go to supply your stomach, your esophagus. It's really common when I find irritation there that someone has heartburn. Or I, I take an x-ray. We do posture analysis. Remember looking in the mirror? And I'm like, hey, see all this shoulder's higher and this one's lower? See all this hips higher and this one's lower? What's going on in between there to get you like that? Let's take a picture and find out. Then we do the x-ray. So it's all of that together. A thorough evaluation goes into figuring out where these people's problems are every single time. And sometimes you can't do all of them. Like a pregnant woman, I'm not going to x-ray. Children under the age of 12, probably not going to x-ray unless there's a really bad trauma. But if they're old enough, they've been, been around enough, long enough, I'm taking a picture of that spine because it's a really, a picture's worth a thousand words. And they've all heard that one. There have been times when I probably could have adjusted somebody without an x-ray, everything would have been fine. There have been plenty of times in my career when I've taken the x-ray, found something I didn't expect to see that I wouldn't have felt with my fingers, and been like, wow, I'm really glad I'm the type of chiropractor that likes to take x-rays. Because we would have missed that. Maybe it wasn't a chiropractor, like an aneurysm, abdominal aneurysm. Everybody know what that is? With that blood vessel that comes down like that starts ballooning out. If they get too big, it's a medical emergency. They gotta put a cage around it so it bursts. It's like ripping the top valve off your heart and you bleed out in minutes. I've had like three or four of those in my career where the person didn't know it was there. It's this big bulging thing in there. I'm like, hey, are you aware of that? And they're like, no. I'm like, you gotta go see your family doctor right now and have them assess this thing because they're gonna x-ray you and you probably Doppler ultrasound every six months to make sure it's not too big and if it's growing, they're gonna put a cage around it to keep it from bursting. And then they come back and be like, my doctor said to thank you because you might have saved my life. That's why we do our thorough evaluation. It's not just to find out what's going on the spine, although that's the main reason we do it. We get to see a lot of other things when we're doing the full evaluation versus, yeah, you have some mutation there, I'll adjust you once or twice, it'll feel better, and then hit the bricks, come back when it hurts again. What's that really treating if I treat you like that? Six, yeah, tip of the icing, six to eight percent that tells your brain it hurts. That's all we're doing. Which, there's time and a place for it. There are chiropractors out there that'll do it. I get people that come in, the, that's what they want. And I'm like, hey, I respect that's what you want. It's not what I'm gonna do. You want that? Go see this guy down the road. He'll do that for you. You ready to get a fix? Come back and see me, because we'll get a fix, okay? You gotta get checked. And one of the biggest enemies we all have to our health, procrastination. One of the five most dangerous words when it comes to your health. Freaking flyers, help me out. Maybe it'll go away. Or it'll probably go away, right? Who said it? I said it. Walk it off. Walk it off, there you go. Just grit, grit your teeth in there, right? Can't afford that bill. There you go. Procrastination. So I'm gonna make you guys an offer today, and it's out of love. If you guys wanna get checked, anybody here wants to get checked, normally everything we do, all of this, $290 for everything we're doing. We're offering it for 20 bucks tonight. But there's a catch, because there's always a catch for these things. It's gotta be tonight, okay? You gotta sign up, Nicole's gonna come around while you guys are getting dinner. She's gonna offer you guys to come in and get that invitation, okay? You have your little note cards in front of you. You can write your information down on that. Give it to Nicole, she'll set up that appointment for you. Okay, 20 bucks, it's due today, okay? So you wake up tomorrow and you decide, I, I wanna get checked. It's back to the 290, okay? And I'm doing that out of love because I want you guys to take action. One of the biggest enemies to our health is procrastination. I want you guys to take action, okay? If you guys have a family in mind, and I get this every single time I do one of these, someone comes up to me and says, so and so should have been here. My brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, whomever. You can buy them that exam, give it to them as a gift. 
they might not use it. I think some of you might have bought gifts for people before and they didn't use it. Some of you have bought gifts for people before and they did use it. Worst case scenario, you're out 20 bucks. Best case scenario, you might have got them living a healthier, better life. You want to get a family check? If you have a family, you're thinking of, hey, I want to get my son's whole family check. We'll do the whole family, it's only 35 bucks, okay? And then we, can, we don't have to schedule them all right here if they're not here, but we can give them that invitation, reach out to them. We do this out of love. That's, what, that's the only time we ever offer it for this price, this, this low, is because we want to spread this mission. And the fact that I'm seeing so many new faces tells me that we have people that are joining us in the mission. And that's what I ask of you guys. It's because I can't change the healthcare model all by myself. We're all trying. We're trying to get people making better decisions but it takes you guys going out, bringing the people in, because a lot of people think we just treat back pain, neck pain, right? And we do, we do that very, very well, but we can do a whole lot more. Back pain, neck pain is only the six to 8% of it. Your entire nervous system is everything, it's your entire life. So that's really all I got for you guys. Nicole's gonna come around, we're gonna start getting the food out here, we'll release y'all for dinner. I'll stick around for just a minute here. I have